Douglas Cooper tells a story in his book, Living God's Love, of something that happened to him when he was a young man that made a profound impression on him. I'd like to share that with you. He was taking chaplaincy training, and he was invited to go to this big chaplaincy convention in Southern California. And there would be chaplains in training coming from all over the southern part of California to this meeting. There would be theology students who were taking their chaplaincy training. There would be people who intended to be chaplains. Some of them would be be bringing their supervisors with them. Oh, it was a big meeting. He was excited. He was looking forward to this. He thought how neat it would be to be among all these professional-looking people. The day came. He arrived early at the convention center. He found his seat. He watched as everyone was coming in. And he was not disappointed in their appearance either. Everybody was coming in in their dark suits and ties and well-polished shoes. Ah, how nice it felt to be a part of this group. But then this one guy came in. He didn't look like all the rest. Instead of wearing a suit, he was wearing green corduroy pants and a red and white striped T-shirt. Plus, he had long hair down to his shoulders. And Doug thought, what's that guy doing here? He doesn't belong here with us. And he started thinking all sorts of negative thoughts about why he would come to a meeting like this looking like that. And then he finally consoled himself, realizing that the chaplains that were coming to this meeting, some of them worked in psych hospitals, some of them worked in general hospitals, and some of them worked in prisons. This guy's probably a prisoner that one of the chaplains brought with him to illustrate how to do a demonstration, how to, how to do an interview or something. Ah, a prisoner. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So he felt a little better. That is, until it was time for everybody to introduce themselves. And when it was time for everybody to introduce themselves, this man stood up and he introduced himself as Paul, a theology student doing his chaplaincy training. Oh no, Doug thought. This guy? He's going to be a pastor or a chaplain soon? Oh no. And the more he thought about that, the more he fumed inside, the more keenly he began to dislike this Paul guy. Well, lunchtime came. They went their ways for lunch. And as they were coming back, Doug and Paul kind of merged in the lobby. They struck up a conversation. And Doug was quite open in telling Paul that he really didn't think he was dressed appropriate for such a meeting. And furthermore, what do your patients think of you coming in in their room with that long hair like that? Well, Paul was also quite open in sharing his situation with Doug. And he explained to Doug that he didn't have a whole lot of money. And in order to keep his school bills paid, he found it necessary to have a job. And his current job was playing for a band in Los Angeles, which he felt necessitated the long hair. And as far as the clothes, well... He only owned one decent set of clothes, and he reserved that for when he was on stage. As they talked, Doug began to soften some in his feelings towards Paul. They continued to talk about about Paul and his interactions with his patients. And Doug could tell that Paul really cared about his patients that he wanted to help them. He wanted what was best for them. And Doug softened more. And as they spent more time together, they actually became friends. That experience made quite an impression on Doug. And I'm wondering, how is it with you and with me? Is there a Paul in your life? What would it take for you and your Paul to become good friends. It may be that this person is a Paul in your life because of the way they look. Or it may be because they have ideas that differ from yours. 
Or perhaps your Paul does things a little differently. Maybe they do something that you wish they didn't do. You see, in our society, we have become accustomed to conditional love and loving conditionally. But there's a better way. The Bible wants to share with us a different kind of love. <clears throat> what is love really? We're all confused in our society about what love is. I can remember when I was a teenager, there were lots of little sayings that began with love is. Some of you may have been exposed to those, but let me just share a few. Love is riding high. What if I'm only in a car? Love is cooking up some happiness together. What if I don't cook? Love is sharing the paper with her. Does everybody like the paper? Or maybe you've heard what Flip Wilson says about love. He says, love is a feeling that you feel when you're about to feel a feeling you've never felt before. <laughs> is love just a feeling? Or is there more to love than that? We say, I love pizza. We say, I love tennis. Or, we love ice cream. We say, I love shopping. I love money. And oh yeah, I love Jesus. Is it all the same? Do they all have the same value? Does the word love mean something different? I'm thankful that the Bible reveals to us more about true love and what love really is. I would invite you to take your Bibles now and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You may want to keep it open to that because we're going to be referring to that chapter throughout the sermon today. If you're using a pew Bible, you'll find it on page 813. This famous love chapter starts out by emphasizing the importance of love. Let's look at the first verse. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Huh? A resounding gong? A clanging cymbal? What's that got to do with love anyway? What does that mean? Well, as I read about this, I came to understand that in Bible times, there would often be a large gong hung out in front of or near the entrance to a pagan center of worship. And so before the worshiper would enter the house of worship, they would bang on the gong to make a loud noise to wake up the God or get its attention before they went into worship. Now you tell me, do you suppose that did any good? Some of the gongs may have been quite fancy. Here's a, an elaborate looking one. And I don't know, it may make a very loud noise. It may make very beautiful sounding noise. But will it wake up a god of stone? No. And Paul is telling us here that we are as worthless as that if we don't have love. Let's look at the next verse. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. I can remember as a child thinking how neat it would be to have the gift of prophecy. And there have honestly been many times in my life that I thought it would be very nice to have the wisdom of Solomon. Unfortunately, God didn't give me either of those gifts. He did give me the gift of faith, but even there I've got a lot of room to grow. Haven't moved any mountains lately. 
But this verse is telling us that even if I had enough faith to move mountains, even if I had the gift of prophecy and all the wisdom of Solomon, I would be nothing if I didn't have love. Love is very important. Moving on to verse 3, if I give all my possessions to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Wow. You know what that means? That means if I give away my car to the poor and my house and all my money, all my clothes, and my shoes, everything I own, but have any love, I am nothing. How is it with you? Do you love everybody? Or is there someone that you hate their guts? Let's be honest. Because the Bible wants us to love. Think about it. Is there someone that you would not want to live next door to in heaven? I've thought about that. And there's something that gives me courage when I think about that. Because after all, if that someone, whoever it is, that doesn't get me excited when I think about them possibly living next door to me in heaven, if they make it to heaven, it means they're right with God. If I make it to heaven, it means I'm right with God. If we're both right with God, we're going to get along. Amen. So if you have such a person in your life, I think the Lord would want us to start loving them now. And you know, there is a difference between love and tolerate. Because I know we tolerate people from time to time, huh? But that's not what the scripture is telling us to do. We need to love them. Let's move on to verses 4 and 5 now. And in verses 4 and 5, we'll find that there are many qualities of love here. I want to first look at the one that says love is kind. Now you may think that one's pretty basic. Got that one, huh? Well, if you're like me, you have temptations even in that area from time to time. When my children were young, they gave me something that was very special to me. They gave me a whole set of pot holders, dishcloths, towels. They gave me this particular set because they knew that I liked precious moments. These towels are special because they're precious moment towels. But they're also special to me for another reason. Because they say, love is kind. And maybe I'm the only one that can say this. But when my children were young, there were times that I got a little frustrated. There were times that my nerves wore a little thin. And when that happened, I'd look down at these towels. And they were my visual aid to remind me that I needed to be kind. And I needed help. So I would send up a little prayer. Lord, help me right now. And he would impress me with the words to say and the tone of voice to use to be kind to my children. So these towels 
are special not just because they're precious moment towels, but they're a reminder of how God answers prayers. And how many times I've looked at these towels, sent up a prayer, and received the answer. These towels became so special to me that I told all my family members never to wipe up anything that might stain with these dishcloths. <laughs> they're about 20 years old now. And they're showing some wear. Some of them even have some stains on them. But they're still special to me. If you need a visual aid, maybe you can think of one that will work just as well for you. But I think that our scripture here is telling us we need to go beyond just being kind. We'll get to that in a moment. But first I want to share with you a story that Dave Simmons wrote in his book, Dad the Family Coach. He tells of a time when he was going to the store. He needed to go to the mall so that he could get some tools from Sears. He had his eight-year-old Helen with him as well as as his five-year-old Brandon. And when they pulled into the mall parking lot, there was a big sign out front, and it said, Petting Zoo. Oh, the kids saw the petting zoo, and it's like, Daddy, can we go? Can we go, please? And so Dave thought for a moment, it didn't take long to think about this one. If I give them a quarter apiece, they'll go have a lot of fun at the petting zoo, while I go in here in Sears and get my tools, and my shopping will probably go quicker too. So he reaches in his pocket and he hands them each a quarter. And they run off to the petting zoo while Dave heads, heads for Sears. And before he even got to the right aisle for the tools in the Sears department, he saw Helen coming up behind him. And he turned and Helen came and met him and she said, Dad... The petting zoo cost 50 cents, so I gave my quarter to Brandon. And then she said something else that really touched her dad's heart. She looked up at him and repeated the family motto. She says, love is action. What do you think dad did then? Maybe not what you're thinking he did. He selected his tools. He took them to the counter. He paid for his tools, and then together, he and Helen walked over to the petting zoo. They stood by the fence and watched Brandon having the time of his life with all those animals. Helen sat there with her hands and her chin on the fence, smiling from ear to ear as she watched her brother enjoying himself so much. Meanwhile, Dave rubs two quarters in his pocket, which he was so tempted to take out and give to his daughter. But no, he knew that Helen needed to learn this lesson of what it meant and experience the gift of giving sacrificial love. Because love is not just action. Love is sacrificial action. It was an important time for both of them. You see, love is not something that's for me. It's for you. Love is something that gives, not something that grabs. As we look back at verses 4 and 5, I want you to notice some other characteristics of love. Love is patient. We talked about the kind part already. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, and it's not self-seeking. That's enough. Wow. Love is none of those. But I want to share a story with you about a man who was not patient, he was envious, he was boastful, he was proud, rude, and self-seeking while doing a kind deed. A young man took a first aid class. 
He was very excited about the things he was learning in this first aid class. When he completed the class, he couldn't wait to get out there and use his new knowledge. And he didn't have to wait long. As soon as he left the building on that last day of class, he walked outside and there right in front of him was an accident and someone was injured. People were starting to gather around. He hurried towards it. He pushed people aside as he hurried towards the injured person. There was a lady attending the injured person. He pushed her aside. He says, I've had first aid. I'll do it. He took over, started caring for the person. The lady he had pushed aside stood there quietly for a moment. And then she said, when you get to the part in your first aid course where it says, call the doctor, I'm right here. Sometimes we may do our kind deed, but not have all the rest of it quite right. I kind of like the way Antonio Torrance says it. Seems like he might have read this chapter. He says it this way. It doesn't matter how many hungry souls you feed. It doesn't matter how much money you put in the collection plate. The only way to get to heaven is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And to love each other as Christ loved us. So I'm telling you, if you want to get to heaven, you're going to love me. Don't tell me how much money, don't tell me how much you love God, but you can't stand my guts. You're going to love me. Don't tell me how well you pray, but you're quick to tell me off or cuss me out. You're going to love me. Don't tell me how much you go to church, read your Bible, or watch T.D. T. D. Jakes, yet you can't give me a hug or even acknowledge me with a nod or a smile. You have to love me. You're going to love me. I think he had internalized this message. And I think it would be good for us too. Because Paul is telling us that we've got to love everybody. And he's echoing Christ's command where Christ says that we must love one another. We need to learn to love like Helen loved, with that sacrificial love. We need to learn that love gives not grabs. Friends, is there someone that you don't like today? Is there someone that you would not want to live next door to for eternity? That is a long time, you know. If there is such a person, let's pray that God will teach us to love everybody. Because it's sort of like that chorus goes, if you want to get to heaven, you got to love everybody. <laughs>